Tonight's subject is eschatology. The term eschatology has been in use only since the 19th century, something entirely new. But in the religious world, they're taking the word and throwing it all over the place, each claiming that they know when the end is coming. For the word really means the doctrine of the end the end of history, but it has nothing to do with secular history, and salvation history has already been brought to its climax and fulfillment. So it's not a thing to do with this world and the stars falling and all these things that people are talking about. So when all these religious leaders get onto the limbs and say the signs are on us for the end of the world, that's a lot of nonsense has nothing to do with anything about moons and stars and whatnot. It's all about salvation history. And God has already brought that to climax and fulfillment in the story of Jesus Christ. It is in the individual that the great dramatic events in the life of Jesus happen. The story of Jesus is an active parable, which I can tell you, you can tell another, in the hope that they will believe it. For the story is to take place in the individual. Everything said of him actually happens in the individual. And when it happens, that is the abrupt cleavage between this world and the, well, you can call it, the supernatural world of God. There are two ages, and this is one age where men appear in the world, they wax, they wane, they vanish. They are restored to life, and they wax, they wane, they vanish. And seemingly forever, until this salvation history takes place in them. And then they are cast in the central realm, they are the star of the drama, and they will experience the story of Jesus Christ in a first-person singular, present-tense experience. And then they will know who Jesus Christ really is. So he is not coming from without. He is within, dreaming the dream of life. And he will awaken within man as that man. This is the Christ of whom I speak. And I am speaking from experience. I am not theorizing. I am not speculating. It has happened in me. And no one could have been more surprised than the speaker when it erupted in me and completed itself in the same number of days as it says in scripture that it would take. 1,260 days for the four major events to take place. <clears throat> Other events take place too, but they are not of the nature, yet they're all related to scripture. Everything is parallel in scripture. For he said within himself, I have come to fulfill scripture. What scripture? That which was foretold concerning God's plan of salvation. Now if you want to read the story of eschatology in the Bible, you will read it in the 13th chapter of the book of Mark and the 24th chapter of the book of Matthew. In these chapters, it is said, they looked at the buildings, these lovely buildings, <clears throat> and one called his attention to the fact that these buildings were beautiful. <clears throat> and he said, you see these buildings? There shall not be left one stone standing upon another, but what it shall be cast down. And then they asked him, when will this be? When will it take place? And he warned them that there will be false prophets, false teachers, who will come into the world and say, I am Christ. Do not believe them. Or they'll perform wonders. In the hope that they will mislead and lead astray, if possible, even the elect. But take heed, I have told you all things beforehand. What he tells you is his life story. It's an active play. As I took you tonight to a play. At the end of the play, I interpret the play for you. 
and I tell you that you saw it as something from without. And then I try to persuade you that what you have just seen is a play that will unfold in you, and you will be cast in the star role. Whether you will believe it or not, that's entirely up to you, but I'll show you the play. And having seen the play, then I will try to tell you what it means. And this is God's plan of redemption, God's plan of salvation. And everyone will be redeemed, because it is only God redeeming himself. It is God who came into the world of death, and it is God who departs from this world after his purpose has been fulfilled. And the purpose of the descent into the world of death is to expand himself. His wisdom must expand. He is not omniscient. There will be no way to live if you are everything now. His power will be expanded because he is not omnipotent. Therefore, everything is an expansion, and to reach that expansion, he first must contract and limit himself to the state called death. And this is the mystery of life through death. The seed falls into the earth and dies in order to be made alive. If it doesn't, then it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much. And the bringing forth is the expansion of God, and we are the gods. Who form the God. So every child born of woman is a son of God, the power of God, the wisdom of God. But completely forgetful of that fact because it had to put on these garments of death. And then it will know when it's about to depart from this world by reason of these signs. And when the signs begin to unfold in them, and they are not spectators of the signs, they are the central figure. They are the star in the entire play. And everything surrounds them. Then they know who Jesus Christ is. So we are warned in the 13th chapter of Mark. If anyone says to you, Look, here is Christ. Or look, there he is. Do not believe him. Because they're pointing to another Christ. If I say, look, there he is, I'm showing you another. There is no other Christ than the Christ in you. God actually became man, that man may become God. So if there is any Christ other than that universal Christ that is crucified and buried within man, that Christ is a false Christ. And false teachers talk about it and tell you of a Christ who is going to come from without and tell you of another Christ who came 2,000 years ago. The story is an active parable. So when Paul had it erupt within him, these are his words to the Galatians. And scholars are all agreed that his letter to the Galatians is the first New Testament book written approximately 50 years A.D. They consider that letter the oldest of the New Testament works. And in this he turns to the Galatians. He said, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law? or by hearing with faith. Are you so foolish, having received the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? Well, the whole vast Christian world and those who hear of the Christian mystery have ended with the flesh, for they think in terms of a fleshly being called Jesus Christ. And this is not a fleshly being at all. While I walk this earth as a being of blood and flesh, in me, in an entirely different realm, the plan of salvation erupts, which abruptly cleaves this space, this time section, from an eternal world of salvation. When these signs appear in you, you will know this is the end of your history in this world. No more dying, no more being restored to life, having gone through the gate of death, only to age, only to wax and to wane, and then to be restored again and continue the journey 
indefinitely. When these things begin to happen in you, you are at the end of history. You are redeemed. But everyone will be redeemed. I don't care what he has done in this world. You will think of a monster like a Hitler who actually murdered millions of innocent people and erupted the whole world. Or a monster like a Stalin. He still is God playing that part. And in this blackness of this world, all right, so we all forget who we are. We look at upon ourselves projected and see others. And we find them as enemies to our little wants, our little desires. And then we go berserk, as these characters did. But they are redeemable. Not one can remain unredeemed. For it would be God losing himself. God is the creative power of the universe. And that God is your own wonderful human imagination. That is God. There is no other God. But man doesn't know it while he's in this state. And he moves through events after events in the secular world. He hears the story and the men who are now self-appointed to tell it do not know it. And they teach a Christ of the flesh. And he tells you, I am born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This second birth that will take place in you is born in that manner. It is born from above. When you were actually placed voluntarily, no one placed you in the tomb. No one took your life. You laid it down yourself. You were the God who made the decision. And you and I collectively agree on this venture for the expansion of ourselves. And we enter death's door, which is simply the human skull. And in that skull we lay down. And there we began to dream, collectively, this great dream of life. We are the gods who came down. And we are the gods who will one day enact the drama of salvation within us. Now, when will it happen? We are told in scripture, no one knows. No, no one, only the Father. Well, the Father is yourself, but you don't know him as yet. Because when it begins to happen, you will discover you are the Father. You are God the Father. As if the whole thing begins to erupt within you. But only the depth of your own being knows to what extent he has gone in the dream. And when he reaches the end of the dream in the world of Caesar, then he awakes and you are he. So no one knows that no one tell you from the signs in the secular world that this is it. It has nothing to do with going to the moon tonight. It has nothing to do with any new discovery in the world of Caesar. It's something entirely different. We are departing from this world of death by reason of these events that erupt within us. And when they begin to erupt, it is on us. And it only takes three and a half years from the first eruption, which is resurrection, you find yourself waking. Now you're told in scripture, we shall all be changed in a moment. Not a few of us, all, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and we shall awake from the dead. Well, that's told in beautiful imagery. No one is sounding a trumpet. The word trumpet means, by definition, reverberation. And may I tell you, if you think that you've had a, a vibration in your body, you might have held at one moment an electrical current. You might have, and survived it. And you might have had the experience of an intense vibration that you survived. But wait until this happens. When this happens, you have never in eternity felt such a reverberation. Your whole being reverberates and you think you can't possibly entertain any other thought than that this is it. This must be a massive hemorrhage. This is what they mean when one actually dies of a massive hemorrhage. But you don't die. Instead of dying, for the first time you begin to live or you begin to awake. And when you awake, you awake in your skull to discover that your skull is a tomb. It's a sepulcher in which you were buried. 
and you enter that sepulchre voluntarily. No man takes away my life. I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down and the power to lift it up again. This is your story. You volunteered for the experiment and you actually deliberately entered death's door, which is your own skull. And you don't know that you're there. You think you're on the outside. You wash your body and you look into the mirror and the outer man is reflected and you do everything for an outer man. You go out and you make a dollar. Try to save a penny of it, that you may have something to more. And you struggle in this world of an outer world, and yet you are dreaming it. You are in your own skull. You are the immortal God in your own skull, dreaming this dream of life. And when you decide that you have finished the dream, you played all the parts. Oh, you played everything in the world. You played the decent person and the one who is not considered the decent person. You played the harlot, and you played the lovely Mother Superior. You played the wonderful Pope or the Bishop, the holy man, and you played the unholy man. You played the thief and the judge who sat in judgment of the thief. You played every part in the world, and no one is going to escape playing all the parts. And when you have played all the parts, and there is no other part to play, no one knows what is that end part you're playing. You may be a good businessman when it erupts. You may be a doctor. You may be a thief. No one can tell you what is the last part you're going to play. Because no one knows the order in which you play them. But you will play all the parts. And there are only so many parts. There are 12 major characters. And then many, I would say, modifications of these 12. Scripture reduces them to 144,000, but it starts with 12, only 12 sons. And then we multiply it by 12, then multiply it by 12, and it brings it to a limit of 144,000 modifications of the 12 major characters. But you'll play them. And if you haven't played them, you're going to play them, because you will not awaken from the dream of life until you have played them. But no one's going to keep you in this world beyond that last character. And then when you reach it, suddenly you know who Jesus is and he never was another. So if anyone ever tries to tell you, look, there is Jesus Christ, don't believe him, or here he is. They could perform wonders, do all kinds of things, but don't believe anyone who points outside of you and says that is Jesus Christ. For Christ in you is the hope of glory. There is no other Christ. And he is your own wonderful human imagination. So don't look to any sign in the world. This is a marvelous thing that we in our land today, looking forward to our boys landing on the moon. I think it's terrific. As far as I'm concerned, I'm thrilled beyond measure. And I hope I'll be right next to that TV on Sunday to watch that boy descend, or the two of them descend. And I can't tell you my thrill, I don't know them, but I'm an American by adoption. And that's my thrill, to watch it. Not only because I'm an American by adoption, and my wife and my children are Americans, but I am a member of the human race. That's man. But that's not eschatology. It has nothing to do with the coming to the end of this drama. You and I are redeemed from this world of death by a series of events. And these events are recorded as events in the life of Jesus Christ. But it is in the individual that these majestic, dramatic events in the life of Jesus happen. They happen in us, but individually. You are too wonderful to have it happen collectively. You are a unique being, and no one can take your place in the eternal temple. And that temple is not something built like this. It is a body. It is a man, a real man, a living man, made up of humanity. Believe it or not, it is a man, and that man is infinite love. I stood in his presence, and it's a man. And you can't think of anything but love in the presence of this man. And that man is the risen Lord. And we are called out of this world, one by one, to be incorporated into that body. But then we are living stones, not dead stones. We are returned from the world of death. And in us, we are life-giving spirits. Without loss of identity, we are part forever of that one living body 
There is one spirit, there is one Lord, there is one God and Father of all. It's a mystery and the world teaches it as secular history and it's not secular history. So when you hear these men who are highly publicized speaking that this looks like the end and he hopes he'll be here when Jesus comes. They don't know who Jesus is. And so when some lady rose the other night and told me that I was most cruel to mention this person's name who was highly publicized, I mentioned his name, I thought of the words of Lincoln. And Lincoln said, to sin by silence, when we should protest, makes cowards of us all. And so he is speaking because he's highly publicized and millions are listening to him and think what he has to say must be true. For he doesn't know the first thing about the mystery of Jesus. So he spends 15, 20 million dollars a year in publicizing himself and his work. So what? Hitler was well known too. And so was Stalin. And there were millions who believed in them. But there were his pulse of the three dollar bill. And why must I restrain the impulse to tell you he doesn't know Jesus Christ and his mystery? Jesus Christ is an active parable, just like a play. We have no record in this world. Search as we have searched, we have found no evidence for the historicity of a man called Jesus. And yet it's the truest story ever told. It happens in man. And our evangelists are all unknown. These names are anonymous. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There is no record as to who Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is. But they related their own experience. When the time had fully come, that which was planned before the world was, began to erupt in men. And by men, I mean generic man, male, female. It began to erupt. And then they knew the mystery of salvation, the mystery of redemption. So I'm telling you what I know from experience. And if you should forget it, read the Gospels. And everything said of Jesus, you're going to experience in a first-person singular, present tense experience. And that is eschatology. That is the end of the journey in this world. You are told in Scripture, you will enter a world that is strange to you and you will be enslaved for 400 years. At the end, you will come out with great possessions, far beyond what you had when you entered. Now, that's all an adumbration. That's a foreshadowing in a not altogether conclusive or immediately evident way. So I tell you that story. Well, what does it mean? These are words stating in scripture as being uttered by the Lord to one called Abraham, the father of the multitudes. So he goes into a land that is not his, a strange land, and he's a stranger in the land, and he's enslaved there for 400 years. What 400 years? You must first understand that in the Hebraic tongue, every letter has a numerical value as well as a symbolic value. Well, 400 is the numerical value of, of the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the letter Tho. There are 22 letters, and then there are five finals, which repeats five of the original 22, but basically there are 22. The 22nd letter has the numerical value of 400, and the symbolic value of that letter is a cross. And the only cross on which the Lord was ever crucified is this. The human form, that is the cross. And this is a strange world to God. In the sense, it's a world of death, and God is the God of the living. But here was the challenge. Not to pretend that he had died, but to die. Actually coming and take the form of death, which is man. And to go through the gate called death and experience death. And still be restored to life. And to continue and die again and die again. And then finally, by his predetermined plan to rise from it all, enriched beyond what he was prior to that, greater power, greater creative power, greater wisdom, greater everything that he had prior to that. So this is the play. And the only Christ is that Christ, not a single little being that was born of a woman who didn't know a man. Then he'll be pretending. 
I must take on the weaknesses of the flesh and all the limitations of the flesh. If I came in here and my earthly father didn't know my earthly mother, and that was something entirely different, I can't teach anyone. I haven't experienced it. No, he had to know my mother, and she had to weave in her body a garment that was a body of death, and I had to occupy it. And so I came in just as every child. And at the end of the journey, I had to awaken within my own skull and then experience the entire story of Jesus in the first person, singular, present tense experience. So everything said of him, I have experienced. Yet don't let me for one moment tell you that would imply, as I talk to you, that I am Christ, meaning I am other than what you are. I know the mystery of Christ. But don't point to me and say he is Christ, then you'll be a liar. Let no one tell you, there is Christ, or here he is. Don't believe it. For the only Christ that you will ever know, you will know in yourself when you experience the story of Christ. Then you'll know you're he. But you don't talk about it. You don't tell anyone to brag, having them point to you as something different from the universal Christ. No. You are, and one day you will awaken. And when you return at the end of the journey, you and I knew each other before we came down. We were brothers then, and we will be brothers again. And in spite of what we did to each other in our dream here, we are still in love with each other, infinite lovers, as sons of the Most High. And it takes us all, as sons of God, to form God. God is made up of the gods, and we are the gods. We are the sons of God that came down by a definite voluntary decision. We weren't forced into it. We came out. The story is told in a beautiful way in the prodigal son. The first son didn't go out. He had everything, but he didn't know he had it. If tonight I had a billion dollars here in the banks of our country, but I didn't know that I had it. Do you know I could die of starvation for want of a dollar? If I was so given that I wouldn't steal, I could be so hungry, and because I would restrain the impulse to steal, not knowing that I had a billion dollars and could buy the whole thing. But if I didn't know it, I could die of starvation. Well, that's what we did. We came down into a world that we owned, and then completely forgot the power that is ours and the wisdom that is ours. And many of us played the part of dying of starvation rather than stealing what we thought we didn't have, when all along we owned it. He was all out, all for the taking, without any consciousness of stealing. But we played the part of the thief, and played the part of everything in this world. So, no matter what a man has done, forgive him. Completely forgive him. I saw in today's New York Times, this survey was just completed, and they brought in their conclusions, these professors back east. Some grant they received from some one of the great foundations. And they investigated 30 ex-convicts who are now in small business back east, confessing that they've earned a net of 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 a year. That's their confession. And then they said, you know, they have what all great business leaders need. They didn't go so far as to say great business leaders have it. Because they're all a bunch of thieves anyway. That's what the professors are telling you. Without that innate something to steal, there couldn't be chairman of the boards. There couldn't be presidents. There couldn't be this. Now, if banks are asking 9.5% for a big loan, a $10 million loan, well, that's not enough. They want a piece of the action. They carry no risk in the piece of the action. They're going to get their 9.5% on their $10 million loan. They're all that. And that enormous usury. Plus, they want a piece of the action. In other words, they want to be part of the profits. But they're not going to take any risk. They are not for one moment taking any risk. And they are the big giants. Well, I wonder if they taught the mafia or the mafia taught them. But that's the same attitude that the mafia adopts. But now they're singled out as horrors. So may I tell you, forgive every being, for in the end, when you come to the very end, and you see the play, and see this entire thing as a play, you too will say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They don't know it. 
they're playing it beautifully. They're playing their part beautifully. And so if I must play that kind of a part, and I have played them all, or I could not now have experienced the drama of the end. If I didn't play the part of the usurer, where I demanded not only 9%, but chances are I got 100%, plus pieces of the action. And so I can forgive him. And so the present conclusion is there had to be. And these 30 men, fairly investigated, they have what it takes for successful businessmen. And they are in business in a small way. And today, a small business is the most difficult thing in the world for these conglomerates. How do you survive? But they have the know-how because they're ex-convicts. And they have that power to be independent, like all big businessmen. They want to be independent. They want to stand upon their own feet and venture and take chances. The average person won't take a chance and he won't venture. So he isn't qualified to lead big business. To lead big business or a big country, you've got to venture. You have to have that courage to take a chance and go broke and then come back. But you have to have that built into you or you, you're not qualified to lead big business. Get off the wheel and work for someone else. But these ex-convicts, and the only difference between the convicts that are investigated, whose story is now brought in, in today's New York Times, and the big leaders of industry, is one was caught and the other wasn't. Only difference. One was caught and the others were not caught. Now that seems cruel. Well then, judge me if it's cruel. But I say God is playing all the parts. And it took all the parts for God to awake from the dream of death. And he dreams it and all of a sudden he comes to the end. So eschatology is the doctrine of the last things. And the last things are the dramatic events in the life of Jesus. And all these events take place in the individual, as the individual's personal experience. Then he knows who Jesus is. And the word Jesus is the same as the word Jehovah. You spell it yod hey Bav, shin ayin but the root is yod hey Bav. Jehovah is spelled yod hey Bav, hey The unpronounceable name, that sacred name, is the name Jesus. So in the end, you are Jesus, and therefore you are Jehovah the Lord who created the whole thing. So this is eschatology in the true sense of the word. And let no one mislead you by telling you that they see in the stars signs of the end of the world. No end of the world. This world is going on indefinitely. Not a thing is coming to any end. If you blow it up, man will rebuild it. If we have a nuclear war, you aren't going to destroy this world. It is a cradle to hatch out God. This is a world of educated darkness. And you aren't going to take a schoolroom and improve it to make it a home. This remains a schoolroom, a world of educated darkness. So when we spend billions to make it easier for people, and billions to make people good, forget it. It's going to be an equal balance of good and evil in this world forever. So right in this world, good and evil, and you can't unbalance it. So you make all these good, but then others must come into the world equally evil to balance it. For we ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that's why we are here. And we had to be here in order to be here. That we judge in our blindness and do all these things in the world. If the world was all good and everybody was so altogether sweet, we wouldn't be here. And may I tell you, there will be no contrast, none whatsoever, and you know from possibly an experience that is not a very, a very pleasant thing. Have you ever been into a society, a group of people who thought themselves so good and so holy? Isn't that boring? Well, I have been among them. I can't conceive of anything more boring than those who think themselves so good and so holy and so sweet. And you wonder, what is it all about? No, give the others that sometimes you have to watch out the side of your eyes. They're more exciting, far more fun in the world. You keep your mind high and dwell on noble things and keep the noble things going, but don't try to rub out the others. It's all part of a school system. We aren't here to make this heaven. Heaven is for the redeemed, and everyone will be redeemed, and everyone is going to come out. 
Now when we come out, we aren't strangers. You take off the mask. And I take off the mask. And I know you. I knew you in eternity. And you knew me in eternity. And we were in love with each other as no one on earth could ever love another. Because we were love itself. We were God. And God is all love. So no one on earth could ever love anyone through these masks. Come on to the love we have for each other when the mask comes off. We are the gods that make up the Lord, and the Lord is the embodiment of infinite love. So, when you go home, read the 13th of Mark. That was the first one written, because Mark came first. In the Bible, it's the second book in the New Testament. But chronologically, it was the first of the Gospels written. And then read Matthew, the 24th. They're beautifully told. Now, see the buildings, he said? They'll all fall. Not one stone will be left standing upon the other. Beautiful imagery. But what are the buildings? These buildings? No. But on the 21st day of December, in the year 1960, after my resurrection, after my awakening within my skull, and my discovery of the fatherhood of God, this vision was mine. I saw all the buildings, beautiful buildings, tall buildings, and I knew before one fell, I knew, that one is going now. Before my eyes, the whole thing fell right to the ground, not leaving one stone upon the other. Then I knew that's going next, that's going next. And I saw everything fall in my imagination, in my vision. And everything fell, leaving not one stone upon the other. It's imagery, beautiful imagery. Well, what were the buildings? What did they uh, signify? The beliefs by which I lived. When all the beliefs by which a man lives tumbles to the ground, I believed in a physical Jesus, that's what my mother taught me. I loved her dearly. She's gone from this world, but the love has not decreased because of her physical absence. I think of mother daily. I can't conceive of a day that she doesn't enter my mind in the same loving way that she did when she was here in the flesh. I don't need a picture of my mother to remind me of mother. Every day I think of my father and my mother who are gone from this world. They are real to me. They are alive to me. And mother taught me that story. But I didn't realize that the story was only an active parable. And my mother didn't. She wouldn't have deceived me, but she hadn't the experience. So when it happened in me that the story is not a secular story, it's a supernatural story marking the end of man's journey in the world of death. And when it happens in him, he knows who Jesus is. Therefore, all the beliefs by which he lived tumble, symbolize as structures, powerful structures. And these are the buildings, the beliefs by which I lived. And when I could no longer accept these external concepts of scripture, then the external world collapsed, leaving not one stone upon the other. Everything came tumbling down. And that all took place within me. So the chapter begins, see these buildings, these beautiful buildings? And then the voice answered, not one stone will be left standing upon the other. And then he tells us, this is the end of the age. Now when will it happen, Lord? And then he tells them of the false prophets and the false teachers that will come, claiming I am Christ. Do not believe them. And they will come with all strange guides. And you perform certain miraculous events in the world. And you will think, surely this one is an unnatural being, maybe he is. Anyone who turns you on the outside and points to someone on the outside as Christ, forget it. He doesn't know Christ, no matter who he is. So when they make a picture of him, there is not one account in scripture concerning the physical appearance of a being called Jesus. Well, certainly, if you're going to write the biography of someone, you will paint some kind of a word picture of the appearance of the person. I do not know of one biography or autobiography where the physical appearance of the individual is not described. There is no description of Jesus in scripture. Why? Listen to these words. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when he appears, we shall be like him. Well, does he look like you, the word picture that people paint? Or the paintings you see on the wall? Or the little icons? And if you are honest with yourself, you will say no. Well, then that's not he. If he's not just like you, that is not Christ. 
It is you that is Christ, and there is no other Christ. That is the great story of Scripture. So when you find him, you're going to find yourself. And it will be the Son of God who will reveal you as God the Father. He will stand before you and you will know him to be your son and he will know that you are his father. And when you see him and you go back into scripture and find the true son of God, that is the personification of all the generations of men and all the experiences of men. And when that one being stands before you who represents all the generations and all the experiences of men and you brought him forth because you went through all the generations and all the experiences of men. And then as a result of that experience, adventure, he stands before you and he calls you father and you know you're his father. He is the result of your journey and so when you know it, well then, you're God the father. But no one can tell you and convince you that you are. You have to experience it. So I'm telling you the signs that will come and you will accept them because you can't possibly deny them. There they are. The meanwhile, let them go forward and teach their false doctrines about the coming of Jesus. And all point is some sign of the heavens saying this is the time for him to come. No one knows, you're told, only the Father. And where is the Father? Call no man on earth Father. Why? Because you have but one Father and he is in heaven and the kingdom of heaven is within him. That's where he is. Call no man on earth Father. You have but one Father, and He is in heaven, and the kingdom of heaven is within you. Haven't you read the words? Yet all these people, these false teachers, insist on you calling them Father. How do they get away with it? They want to be called Father, and yet they tell you they are celibates. Celibates, and they are Father. Well, it doesn't go down with me. But you see, I can speak boldly because I can speak with authority. Because my authority is based upon experience. I have experienced the mystery of Christ. And so I am not theorizing. I am not speculating. So when someone challenges my wife to say, well, go on and challenge it. You're only listening to a false doctrine when you point to some Jesus as a being of flesh. He is born not of the flesh. It's an entirely different birth. It's a supernatural birth. Your return to heaven can only be accomplished by birth from above. As told us in scripture, except he be born from above, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. It's impossible to return wearing a garment of flesh and blood. And so you're wearing garments of flesh and blood here from the time that you enter it until the time you depart. You depart tonight through the gate called death, you are dead. No one dies. At the very moment they call you dead, you are restored to life in a garment just like the other one, only young. Not an infant, about 20 years of age. Nothing missing, no teeth missing, no hair missing, no eyes missing. Perfectly restored. Young and wholesome and healthy, filled with fire. And you too want to express yourself in the sexual world as you do here. You marry there too, just as you marry here. And you get old there too. And you go to the inn and you die there too, to find yourself restored once more to a young body, just like the other one, only young and beautiful. And you go on again through all the struggles, playing all the parts, until the time of the end. And when the time of the end comes, these eternal stories unfold within you. So there's no speculation about this. Sacred history has already reached its climax and its fulfillment. It's not being changed. Things here are being changed, but not sacred history. That's all done. And you will one day experience this sacred history. And you will know exactly who you are, and you are God the Father. Now, I will not take back one word I've told you, because I know what I'm talking about. Didn't read in the book. I'm like Paul. He said, no one taught it to me. Never heard it from another. But it came through a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what he said. He was the very one who went out to destroy the entire concept. But that it happened in him. And then he understood it was not the external worship of law. The rituals and all the things that the churches of the world do had not a thing to do with that. For you can't earn it. There's no acquiring merit to get into the kingdom. Just wait for that moment in time. 
So he tells you, set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. For this is the hope that actually makes it wisdom to accept the burdens of this long, dark night of time. So it seems a long night. Yes, it is a long night. A dark night, yes. I am enslaved for by 400 years. By 400 being just as long as I wear the cross. But I am promised that at the end of the 400, being the end of the wearing of the cross, I will come out with enormous possessions, far, far greater than what I possessed when I ventured, volunteered to enter the world of death. And everyone is going to come out, not one can fail. When you return, as the Lord seems to be the groom. Now, are there any questions, please? Yes, we have a number of these partners. I have recalled many. So I would not say that we can. I wouldn't say that. No, I would not say that at all. I live a very modest life today, quiet, modest, small income from my efforts in what I'm doing. Well, I'm self-employed and I take off voluntarily between three and four months a year because I find that I need that sort of rest and I need it for the very ones who come regularly to my meetings. And yet, in my interval of taking off between three and four months a year, I have no income. Someone gets a month's vacation or two months' vacation, the corporation pays him. So he's paid. I'm not paid. I'm completely on my own. I take off any time, and I am simply self-supporting in my work. All right, I live a modest, a very quiet and modest life. And yet, I have a vision of an experience. I have the most fabulous home. I can see it now. Beautifully furnished. Everything in it was a museum piece and yet functional. It was not there just for appearance's sake. It was functional. A full complement of servants. I can see my gardens. I can see all the gardeners that I had. I can see my secretary and his assistant. I can see the chefs. They all love me. Love me dearly. I was a bachelor. I can see it vividly, and I return in my imagination. See, all these things are always taking place. So I returned in my imagination to this, and all of them greeted me so beautifully. And they all said, the Lord is back, not meaning God, for they call me by the title called Lord. Yes, if you, pe you speak of people here in the world, Lord so-and-so. Well, to them, I was their master, their Lord. Not in the sense of being God, just simply a man with a title called Lord. And they all greeted me beautifully in this return, but I can see the fabulous wealth that I possessed. And it was decadent. I didn't grow with all my wealth. I simply could indulge myself, and no matter what I wanted, I could grant it, because I had it. And then I recall deliberately walking out of that place and not, not returning. I walked out completely and left it all behind me. And yet I had everything that money could buy and I bought only the best. My home was beautifully furnished. Everything in it was a museum piece. And my servants were beautifully trained. They are not just servants. They were of the highest. My secretary, everyone, my butler, they were gentlemen in their own sphere. Yet they were my servants. And I had a full complement of servants in my home and a full in my gardens. And I walked out never to return. So I have a vivid memory in this world of Caesar of having fabulous wealth. Then I came back in this time. I came here in a world of poverty. A father who born and raised ten children. There were twelve but two died at birth. And so we were a family always of 13 because my grandmother lived with us and he had little. And so I came into that environment. I needed that environment. And that was the last environment in which I played the part before departing this world to return to my brothers. 
and I'll return, like the prodigal son, to find that I am enhanced beyond my wildest dream by reason of the venture. Not all the sons came up, by the way. The first son didn't come, meaning he represents those who did not volunteer. Therefore, he remains unaware of his wealth. The second one volunteered and took a chance of remaining permanently in a world of death. But if he didn't, and he survived and could get back, he would be enhanced beyond the wildest dream of any. And those who did not come out do not share that power. He is then used on a higher level of creativity. So I have a vivid, vivid, I can see it so clearly in my mind's eye. And yet today in this world, I live a very normal, modest life. Fortunately for me, my wife goes along with it. She makes no excessive demands on my purse. In fact, I don't have any, I give it to her. So if I have anything, she knows it, but I don't. So she has everything, so I can't really run away. When I leave home, I said, now, may I have two dollars? Can't go very far, get no tax, you can't go more than a few blocks on two dollars. So you, I really can't run, let me have two dollars, in the event that I want to get back home. So she gives me two dollars. Are there any questions, please? Yes, sir. No. The question is, can we play many roles in the one span of life here? Why well, certainly we play many roles. The same identity. Like the same actor playing Hamlet that plays Richard, that plays something else. But the same actor. Well, I was a dancer for 11 years. Prior to that, I worked for J.C. Penney for the large amount of what, $20 a week. And then they fired me. I said, what have I done? Nothing. Business is slow. So, business is slow. I said, what am I going to do for money next week when rent is due? So that's not my problem. So, when I continued the argument, he said, well, now, I can see he doesn't understand the facts of life, so when you're 20, you're full of courage and do all kinds of things. I was then 17. So he gave me a letter to his friend up at Macy's and said, he doesn't understand America's rules, so give him a job if you have one. So I was getting, I think, 22 at uh, J.C. Penney, and they employed me, and they gave me 20. At least I had a job then, 20. And I figured I will not work for anyone again. I'm going to stick this out just as long as I can, and I'm going to quit. This time, I am going to quit. They aren't going to fire me. I'll never be fired again. So I worked there for a year and six months, and then I gave them notice. I said, why? I said, I'm just going to quit. There's no reason, no excuse. I'm quitting. And then from then on, I worked for myself. So I would come in under the heading of these ex-cons. They refused to work for another. <laughs> they had it all within themselves and they wanted freedom and independence. All the qualities that the say big business leaders need and have. So you play all parts. I was a dancer. I run an elevator for Macy's, a bus boy putting things in the bin when they and I saw all the little tricks of the trade. I saw how they operated, because as a bus boy, you see things. And some lady came in one day and she wanted a, she wanted lily white honey. And that was 10 cents more than the red star honey. And so, unfortunately, I didn't have lily white honey on display. I should have kept the bin filled, but I didn't have it. So the salesman who took the order came back and said, the lady outside, and she can't have any honey but lily white honey. And you didn't do your job by keeping the bin filled. And so get one up quickly. Well, the lily white honey and the red star honey was the same honey brought unmarked by the car loads. And the girls rolled in the lily white and charged 10 cents more and rolled in the red star and charged 10 cents less. So it took off one red star and rolled into the right little white and she was satisfied so she paid 10 cents more for it. And that's how business operates. There are some ladies who cannot buy a decent coffee because they do not have in themselves the innate knowledge of taste. Their taste buds are gone. So if they go into a store they must read the price tag. 
Someone once told a story, if you went into Selfridge in England and you took all the tags and changed them and took a piece of cut glass and put on it the price of a great diamond and then put that price of the cut glass on the diamond. The average person not understanding jewelry, having no enough knowledge at all, would buy it but based upon the tag. They'll buy a piece of cut glass and pay the price of a great diamond because they do not know values. They can only see tags. And business operates upon that business. They'll buy a bag of coffee and cut it in half. And this one is 15 cents a pound more than this one. Because someone wants to pay more. You go into a resort and you get a hotel. And there are certain people who will not go to a hotel unless they feel themselves above the hoi polloi. Who cannot afford a hundred dollars a day. They can afford a hundred dollars a day. So they go to these places. And in the little island of Barbados we supply them all. So they get no better meat than the place that charges ten dollars a day. So when you go to their dinner, so it's a nice dinner, no question about it, but you're paying a hundred dollars. And we are the suppliers of all the hotels. We get no more from one or the other, but we know some people operate that way. They can't stand meeting with those who think themselves, you know, they must be below. And they're quite willing to pay for it. And people knowing that weakness in the human heart, they cater to it. I saw them in Barbados come down from LA. And they come down with all their black glasses on and their incognito. And there, no one in Barbados knew them anyway. Didn't have to come incognito. But they saw to it before the day was out that you knew who they really were. They couldn't stand being not known. All they came down with all their big black glasses and all these things hiding under these things. But don't tell me you don't know who I am. I'll take it all off and spell my name out for you. You must know me. And then of course it comes up in the paper. Who do you think is here? And the average person reading the paper never heard of her anyway. No, my dear, Earth does not terminate at the point where my senses cease to register it. When a friend dies tonight, and the world calls him gone from this world. And he's cremated, he turns to dust. We think, well now he's gone. No, the world is just like this. It's terrestrial, solidly real. And the body that he will wear is flesh and blood. You cut him and he'll bleed. And he has pain there, and he has pain here. It's the identical life that he's living here. Only he hasn't gone the journey. What three score and ten, that's not long enough? We spend thousands of years in the journey. 400 was only the symbolic figure of the cross, but it's certainly not 400 years. Thousands of years we have walked this earth, and this earth appears in sections of time. And so when I depart, not now, for now I'm leaving it permanently, but those I love who will depart, and those I love who have departed, are restored to life in bodies of flesh and blood. And they're real, may I tell you, solid. And they go through the struggles, just as they do here. And there is business there, as here. And there are doctors, dentists, all things there. And we grow old and decay there too. And die. It's Earth, sir, it's Earth. This Earth is fabulous. It's not just a photograph from the moon, as we see it as a section in time. That section in time only represents that little moment in time. But this Earth is fabulous. And they're all taking place here now. This earth, the millions who have died, and the billions who have and will, are on earth. It's this earth, but a different section of time. For instance, tonight's dinner is still taking place. It seems crazy. You think that's gone. It hasn't gone. It's taking place.